Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. This is the first session of investigating time series of satellite imagery. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and my, me and my colleague Amber McCullum will be presenting the session one and session two for you. For this training, we have two two-hour sessions on April 15th and April 17th. Note that you only need to attend one session per day. The same material is presented twice each day. You can find all the course materials at the website listed. This includes past recordings, data links, and homework exercises. We will have a Q&A session at the end of each session. However, you can also email me or my colleague at the email addresses listed below. We will have one follow-on homework that is now available on the course website. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline. Note that the deadline for the homework is in two weeks, Wednesday, May 1st. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend both webinars and complete all the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. So here are the course prerequisites. You should take the e-learning course, Introduction to Remote Sensing, or have the equivalent knowledge. You should also take our previous webinar on change detection for land cover mapping. For the next session, you'll need to install Google Chrome, and you'll also need to make sure you have a Google Earth Engine account. So not for this session, but for the next session. We won't be doing any code editing ourselves next week, but it's a good idea to have this account for future use. So just to give you a heads up on that for the next session. You can access all the course materials here, including a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish and then any data necessary, and then the PDF of each week's in each session's in-class exercise. A link to view the recording of each session's webinar, and also a link to the Google form for the homework submission. In, session, in, the, in this session, we're going to provide an introduction to time series analysis, and we're also going to be doing an exercise um, using Appears, which is a, a web-based tool to do um, time series and other kind of satellite image um, analysis. And then session two will be an overview of LandTrender, which is another web-based tool to do time series analysis. And then there will be an exercise for that one as well. So the agenda for today for session one is first, I'll discuss an overview of time series satellite imagery, and then I'll discuss types of time series analysis, such as annual and seasonal trends, anomalies, and, and environmental descriptors. Then I'll talk about some time series tools that you can access, um, and finally, sustainable development goals, um, including open data cubes. And then I'll do a quick overview of appears, and then we'll jump into an exercise. So first, I'll start off with an overview of time series satellite imagery. In the past, the only way we could easily use satellite Earth observations for analyzing change over time is to use two or three dates of imagery. But in recent years, that has changed because of the availability of long-term satellite data sets like Landsat and MODIS. Increased computing power and cloud computing and also improved algorithms for processing long time series of data has also improved our ability to, to um, do this change detection. There are many different types of time series analysis that you can do with satellite Earth observations, including annual and seasonal trends, both gradual and abrupt changes, anomalies, and environmental descriptors. I'll be describing each of these in more detail next. Annual trends include assessing changes over long time periods. Typically, 
projects might choose one month out of each year or calculate the annual mean of some remote sensing product like NDVI. For example, this project from Liu et al. analyzed trends in vegetation greenness in China using annual mean leaf area index from MODIS between 2000 and 2014. And they analyzed the change in evapotranspiration and water yield. On the right-hand side, analyzing seasonal trends are usually driven by temperature and or precipitation cycles within a year. This example from Immerzeel et al. analyzing snow cover in the Himalayas using MODIS seasonal snow cover between 2000 and 2008. The images show the percentage of time that a pixel was snow covered during the season within that time period. Satellite Earth observations can be used for analyzing gradual changes like insect infestation in forests, land degradation, and forest recovery, or for abrupt, abrupt changes due to events like wildfire, deforestation, and urban development. The graph on the right shows both abrupt and gradual changes that occur in forests. A wildfire causes an abrupt de decrease in NDVI values, while the subsequent regrowth results in increasing the NDVI values over a long time period. Anomalies are relative differences from a long-term average. This example shows global NDVI anomalies for drought monitoring from the FAO. If you're interested in knowing how to calculate NDVI anomalies, I encourage you to view our previous webinar on NDVI. Time series data can be used to derive environmental descriptors for habitat suitability or species distribution modeling. An example of this are dynamic habitat indices that use time series of satellite observation of greenness to describe vegetation dynamics. In this example, a DHI is used to understand bird species richness across the US. DHIs capture seasonal variations in energy that bird species can utilize in the form of food. Important vegetation dynamic variables include productivity, minimum level of perennial cover, degree of vegetation seasonality, all derived from MODIS gross primary productivity products between 2003 and 2014. Next, I will be discussing time series tools. First, I will discuss various tools used for visualizing time series data, such as Google Earth, Google Earth Engine, and the Sentinel Hub EO browser. After that, I will discuss tools for analyzing time series data, including Open Data Cube, Be Fast, and Appears. My colleague, Amber McCollum, will discuss land trender in the next session. I will be doing an exercise on appears after this presentation. Many of you know that you can use Google Earth to visualize time series from satellite imagery. To do this, you can just select historical imagery under the view menu at the top. This example will show the growth of Las Vegas over time. To look at what time periods are available, you can use the bar at the top. For Las Vegas, there's imagery available between 1950 and 2016. Next, you will see the growth of Las Vegas between 1984 and 2016. So here's 1992, 2004, and finally, 2016. You can see how much Las Vegas has grown over time in this area. Next, I will show you how you can use Google Earth, Earth Engine to visualize time series imagery using time lapse. When you bring up time lapse, you can choose your area of interest in the top left. Once you do that, you will be able to see the available data across the bottom. For this example, we are looking at the decrease 
of the Baban Rafi Forest in Niger between 1987 and 2013. The first image shows the forest extent in 1987. So now you can see how the forest has decreased in 1994, and then in 2001, in 2013, The third visualization tool is a Sentinel Hub EO browser from the European Space Agency. On the left, you can select the imagery you want to use, including Sentinel 1, 2, and 3, and Landsat and MODIS. In this example, we have selected Sentinel 2. You can also select the maximum cloud coverage and the time range. On the upper right, you can select the location. In this example, I've selected Brazil. Once you click the search button, the footprints of the available images will appear in the window, and an image and associated data of each image is on the left. You can create a time lapse animation by clicking the icon on the right. Once you do that, another screen will appear that will allow you to select which images you want in the animation. First, you can select the time frame at the top. Then you can select the maximum amount of cloud cover that you want. And finally, you can select the images that you want, all on the left-hand side. Once you select those images, you can then play the animation. And then as you can see also, there's a button to download that Im those images if you want. Lastly, I wanted to tell you about Open Data Cube, which is an open source geospatial data management and analysis software project. It includes algorithms and applications that use time series satellite data for applications like deforestation, water quality, and illegal mining. You can find out more about this project at the website listed here. Recently, the Africa Regional Data Cube was developed to ad address sustainable development goals. This data cube was a partnership between the Committee on Earth Observations, the Group on Earth Observations, Amazon Web Services, and Strathmore University in Kenya. One of the most valuable ways to use time series data is by graphing the patterns to identify short-term and long-term trends. Example of, examples of this include using monthly NDVI values to look at phenology trends. You can use that information to calculate annual maximum, minimum, or mean values, depending on your application. You can also use changes in annual NDVI values to look at short or longer term land cover trends. One way to do this type of analysis is using breaks for additive seasonal and trend method or BFAST program. This program decomposes time series satellite data into trend, seasonal, and remainder components. It allows you to pinpoint the location and timing of changes. It is available as an R package at the website listed here. Lastly, the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC, has developed application for extracting and exploring analysis-ready samples, or APPEARS. APPEARS is a web interface for accessing, processing, and visualizing geospatial data products. The data available in APPEARS come from the LPDAC the Socioeconomic DAC, or CDAC, and the National Snow and Ice Data Center, or NSIDC. 
Currently, there are NASA VIRS Surface Reflectance and LAI FPAR products, as well as MODIS Aqua, Terra, and combined land products for all tiled Level 3 and 4 data. There are also web-enabled Landsat data for the conterminous United States and Alaska, and NASA's Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM, version 3. From the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, there is the United Nations Adjusted Gridded Population of the World, or GPW version 4, and MODIS snow cover products from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Also from NSIDC, the LPDAC has recently made the Soil Moisture Active Passive, or SMAP, soil moisture products available. Appears allows you to upload polygons or points to acquire coincident satellite data products. You can start a new request, copy a previous request, or upload a request file. You give your request a name, and then you can upload or drop a file into the blue box. In this case, if you are extracting a point sample, you can drop or upload a CSV file. Next, you indicate the time period of interest. Finally, you select the remote sensing data layers that you want to use. And it's as simple as that. You simply submit it, and then you get um, the results in a very short time. So at this point, we're going to go through an exercise that uses um, appears to use point and polygon data to extract some MODIS data. So let's get started. All right, everyone, we're going to get started with doing exercise one, which is extracting um, MODIS time series data using appears. And this first part of the exercise will be actually extracting, um, using point data, uploading point data, and extracting some MODIS data with that, uh, with that point data. Um, but first of all, I want to go over the objectives and the software and tools that you'll need for this exercise. So the, the objectives of this is to um, identify some MODIS imagery um, to compare with point and polygon data. And it's really easy to do in appears. Um, and then we're going to visualize some time series results actually in appears, and then we'll also use Excel to do some basic sort of visualizations as well. Um, so the important thing to realize is um, you need to sign up for a free NASA Earth Data account in order to, um, to run this exercise in appears, um, and you'll also need Microsoft Excel. What I would recommend that you do for this exercise um, is it might be difficult to follow along because you have to um, submit a request to the LP DAC to get your results. And sometimes that can take a while depending on what else is going on. Um, and then this particular exercise, uh, I already have the results downloaded just to make it a little easier to show you the exercise. So what I recommend that you do is just follow along uh, with with me um, on this exercise and then later on actually submit the jobs yourself and then run through the exercise and then if you have questions you can just email me um, sometime uh, during the week. I also want to let you know on Wednesdays generally the LP DAC um, is down doing maintenance on their system so if you try to do this exercise um, sometime on Wednesdays uh, if you uh, don't get any results at all for a while, that's why. So I, you might avoid um, doing anything on uh, Wednesday. So let's go ahead and get started. The other thing that you'll need um, is some associated data. There's a CSV file called beetle.csv, which is a point location uh, in Colorado where beetle infestation has caused some forest mortality. And you will also need a zip file. It's actually a shape file, um, but you'll need it zipped. Um, and it's a polygon from the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. 
Um, you can download those from our website and um, they'll also be available um, during this session. So for this exercise, um, we're going to be using this point data um, where forest disturbance has occurred in Colorado. Colorado experienced um, some heavy um, pine and bark beetle mortality between about 2001 and 2018, um, killed a lot of trees in that area. So we're gonna look at the time series, um, the MODIS time series of those data to show how different values have changed over time. So the first thing we're gonna do is go to um, the appears data set, which you can see right here. It says, welcome to appears. And I'm actually already uh, logged in. So when you first do it, you need to log in. Make sure you get your um, get your login. Um, it's all free. And then once you get logged in, you'll be able to actually uh, upload your points and polygons. So the first thing we're going to do is go under Extract. And we're going to click Point Sample. First we'll do points and then we'll do polygons. So in this case, we're gonna start a new request. I actually have some previous requests, um, which I can select here, but you will start a new request. Um, I'm actually gonna click on the previous request because it'll, it'll show you the same thing. So in this case, you're going to give um, your sample a name at the top, and we will call it Beetle 1. And then the next thing you're going to want to do is upload your coordinates from a file. So you can do a couple of things here. You can actually drop a CSV file into this box, or you can click here to upload. So what I'm going to do is show you. I'm going to I'm going to actually drop my CSV file in there even though see it's already in there, but I'm going to drop it in there. So as you can see, I have a beetle.csv. I just drop it in there and then it actually shows up again, but your file will show up here on the right-hand side. It gives you the format that you need. Um, so the CS file can contain up to four columns separated by commas with each coordinate on a separate line. So this is how my CSV file is set up. So the ID is here where it says B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, B6, and B7. So those are the points and those are the IDs I gave them. Then you can give it a category. So if you had like a, if it was a land cover map or something like that, some way you wanted to label that, you could do that here. And then you'll put the latitude in decimal degrees and the longitude in decimal degrees. So you can see I have that here for each point. I have the ID, I have the latitude in decimal degrees and the longitude in decimal degrees. So it's very simple to upload these points. The next thing you're going to want to do is put in the dates. And in this case, we want to have um, we want to have a uh, some data from MODIS from one time period from one month each year. So in order to do that, so you don't get all the months in a year, is you have to click on is date recurring right here. So we're saying yes, the date is recurring. And then what you do is you put in the start date here. So in this case, it's June 1st. And you do that by clicking on the little calendar. And you'll see uh, the months at the top here. And you can just click over to see June and then put in, click on June 1st. So that's what pops in there. You do the same with the end date. In this case, we want the end date to be June 30th because we want just one month of data. 
So in this case, you do the same, click June, and then click, click 30th, and you have 630. And then you want to put below that the year range. And in this case, we want 2002 to 2018. So by doing that, you just click the slider here. So I'll put 2002, and I already have 2018, but you can just adjust the slider till it says um, 2018. And then the next point, and the last part of this, it's very easy, is you want to select the layers to include in your sample. So what we'll do here, in order to search for a product, unless you know the name of the product, um, you can also put in a um, some names like vegetation or land cover or something like that. So in this case, we want to do um, vegetation indices. So we'll type the word vegetation here. And then you can see below that, there's a whole list of um, vegetation products that, modus vegetation products that show up. And in our case, what we're interested in is in the mod 13A3 version 6. So it's this one right here. So what it is, is the one kilometer monthly NDVI and EVI products. So you click on that. So once you click on the Terramotus vegetation indices, you'll see all the data products available underneath this. So there's EVI, there's reflectance data, um, but what we're interested in is the one kilometer monthly NDVI product. So in order to add that, you just click on the plus to the right. And you'll see on the right-hand side, um, the selected layer, under the selected layers box, you'll see that NDVI products show up there. And at that point, you just will um, click submit, and then it will send that order to the DAC. So I have already completed this order. So once you submit it, you can go to the top where you see explore here, and if you click on that, you'll see your explore request. So when you submit the Beetle 1 request, you'll see it show up here. And then right here under status, um, there will be a little bar that shows you where it is in terms of um, downloading um, or getting that data. And in my case, it's already done since I've done this already. Um, and then it gives you some other information about that request here, the date submitted and the date completed. So let's take a look at this request once it's done and show you what kind of information and visualization tools that you have available through this web browser. So if you click on your request like this, just click Beetle 1, you'll see a box that comes up that says Viewpoint Sample. And this first tab, there's three tabs at the top here. The first one is temporal comparison. So this allows you to look at the time series for one of each point one at a time. And you can pick your point here. So there's a where it says site, there's B1, but if you click on the drop down list, you'll see B1 through B7. So you just look at one point at the time. So we'll just um, take a look at B1 right now. For quality, you can actually select if you want to show all the data or if you just want to show the good quality data because sometimes modus pixels are not necessarily good quality um, so you'd want to eliminate those so in this case we'll just look at the good quality data and in our case we've only have one data layer we only have that ndvi data layer so there isn't any other options um, for that one so now we're going to scroll down a little bit and we see the time series graph. So the first thing we're going to do is add a line because it's just easier to see the trend once you add that line. 
And so remember, this is just for one pixel, but on the um, x-axis, you can see all the different years that we have, and on the y-axis, you can see the NDVI values. And it's even clear at this point, for this one particular point anyway, um, the big decrease in NDVI values between about 2006, between 2006, 2007, and um, into 2008, um, which is when a lot of the tree mortality ha occurred. And then you can kind of see a slow increase over time as, it, as the uh, forest started to recover from that mortality. So if you hover over each of these points, you can get the actual NDVI value. And then you also see the quality, um, in this case, um, these are these are the good quality points. And then if you want, you can go back and take a look at a few other points and the differences before between these points. So if I look at say the B6, you'll see a little bit of a different graph for that one. It still has that drop, but the trend is just slightly different between the two. So this is just a way you can visualize your um, your points one at a time. The next thing we're going to do is go to the Categorical Overview tab, which is right here. So we're going to scroll down until we see this quality graph. So this graph shows how many satellite pixels had good quality, which is quality zero, so that's the blue box here, and how many had quality one, which is questionable quality. So this just gives you an idea of how many pixels um, had good quality and not so good quality. So if you put your mouse over the orange box, you'll see that there are three pixels where it says n equals three that had questionable quality. And you can do the same for the blue box where you see um, 116 pixels had uh, good quality. So we're going to scroll down until we see the sites graph. And this graph shows you the mean and range of the NDVI values for each site. So you remember we had seven sites, B1 through B7. And then again, on the y-axis, you see the NDVI. And so what this does is tell you what the values are and the standard deviation for um, NDVI for each of these sites. So you can put your mouse over the box to actually see what those values are. You can see, for example, this first B1 box has 17 pixels, um, and the average, the mean NDVI is um, 0.54, and then you can see what the range is there and so forth. In this particular graph, you may uh, want to only look at the good quality um, pixels, so you can go up and click on the the blue box. So remember, zero means good quality, and one means not good quality. Um, so if you click on the blue box, it actually turns off the bad quality pixels. And then you go back down, and then the new graph down below actually reflects only the good quality pixels. Okay, so that's it for um, using appears to sort of analyze your data. The next thing we're going to want to do is actually download the results. So to do that, you go back up to Explore, and then you'll see your request again, and then you'll click on the download button to get the contents of that request. So I'm just going to show you what that looks like, since I have that already. So there's lots of different files here. Um, the most important one for us is this one right here. It's the CSV file um, that shows the NDVI values and a few other things 
um, for each of our B1 sites, our B sites. Um, so we're going to um, look at these, this file in a little more details and do some really basic kind of um, manipulating of that file so you can visualize your, your results. All right, so now I have my uh, results spreadsheet open. And you, as you can see, there's a lot of information here. Let me just go through a couple of the most important things. First, on the far left-hand side, you can see the ID. So that's B1, B2, et cetera, all the way down through um, B7. You can see the latitude and longitude associated with each of those points. Um, and you can see the date. So we just did um, June. So you have June of each year, year located here. So you get the years and that's in the D column. And then the other important piece of data here is um, the H column. So that has um, your NDVI values. So one of the things um, that we wanna do before we get started analyzing these data is again, we wanna eliminate the lower quality uh, data points. So in order to do that, we can filter out those data points. So we're only looking at the high quality data points. So in order to do that, you, you can filter out by clicking on data and then clicking on the filter icon at the top. And when you do that, I've already actually done that, but I'll show you what happens when you do that. You'll see little arrows appear in the first row across the top, so where those labels are. So if you go to column N right here and click on the arrow, you'll see the labels in that column are either decreasing quality, um, two de de decreasing quality labels, a highest quality label, and then a lower quality label. So of course, the only thing we really wanna take a look at um, are the highest quality pixels. So we'll, de we'll deselect everything else. So the only thing that we have um, showing is, uh, oops, I just clicked on select all, is highest quality, as you can see that right there. And then you close it, and then once you look at all the points here, it'll just say highest quality. So the only thing we're really interested in here is column A, which is the ID, column D, which is the date, and column H, which are the NDVI values. So you can either take this sheet and get rid of all of the other columns. Um, what I ended up doing is copying, and we have this in our um, exercise, uh, is actually selecting and copying this whole spreadsheet into a different um, worksheet at the bottom here. So I'm gonna click on um, this tab that says at the bottom, that says NDVI1, which I created already. And as you can see, I've eliminated all the columns except for the ID, the date, and the NDVI values. Everything else is gone. And we already know these are only the good quality data. So as you scroll down, um, if you're to look at your dates, you won't have these gaps yet, but you will notice that there are some years missing, and that's probably because they have low quality data. So in this particular spreadsheet, you'll notice in yours before you start um, making any edits that, for example, um, for point B2, it's missing the year 2015. For point B3, it's actually missing the year 2007. Um, and 2011 and so forth. So in order to make 
your resulting graph look good, you need to fill in uh, these cells, um, but you'll leave the modus, um, the NDVI values blank. So we've given you the list on page 11 of the missing data points. You'll see them as you go through the years. Um, but again, uh, almost all the points, uh, point two, let's see, B3, B4, B5, and B6 all have missing years. So you'll need to sort of do exactly as I did here, where you add, um, add a row, put in the year, and the name of the point, and then just leave the NDVI value blank, just like this. And you'll go through and do this for the whole spreadsheet. Okay, now the next thing and last thing we need to do is in order to actually visualize the trend in these points, we need to reformat how the spreadsheet looks. So we reformat that. If we go uh, make another worksheet, and at the bottom I have another tab called NDVI2, you can make that other tab. And what we need is in the first column, we need the date. And then in the subsequent columns, we need B1 through B7. So you can see how that looks differently from the NDVI1. So in other words, you'll just copy and paste the dates into column A. And then for column B, you'll put all the B1 values, um, and B2, you'll put all the B2 values, and so forth. And you can see where the blank spots are, where we don't have data because of those um, bad quality pixels. So the last thing we're going to want to do is make a scatter plot or a time series graph. So it, uh, we're going to go to Insert. Um, I have a PC. It's a little bit different for a Macintosh. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, to follow along okay. And in my case, what I want to do is click on the scatter. And then I'm going to choose the scatter with straight lines and markers. You know what? It helps if I actually select my data first. Let me delete this. Okay, first you have to select your data. And then you insert your graph. So as you can see, it's kind of messy with all the points on there. You can see the general trend. Um, but to make it a little bit easier to see, what I'm going to do is just look at two or three points at a time, just so you can see um, what the trend looks like. So I'm going to delete this chart one more time, and I'm just going to select maybe three points, something like that. And then we'll insert the chart again. Okay, so now you can see just three points. You can see it a little bit better. But because the Y value range is so big, it's really hard uh, to get a feeling for what's um, really happening with this data. So we're going to um, change the um, values of the Y axis to make the data just look a little bit better. So in order to do that, you can just right click on the um, Y axis and then you go to format axis. And at least on the, the PC version, you'll see um, a whole lot of things you can do to the Y axis. And in our case, we're going to want to change our minimum to sort of look at our minimum value here. So we'll change it to 0.35. Okay. Let me just get that. So the 
chart's a little squished. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. But you can see how the y-axis helps spread out the data a little bit. Um, we do have some points that are um, discontinued, and that's where our bad data are. But generally, you can see the trend between about 2006 and 2008, uh, that decrease in NDVI values due to the forced mortality from the bark beetles. And then in some of the points, actually most of the points, there's been sort of a slow increase over time. So this just shows you how you can um, get some point data associated with um, MODIS data. Um, there will also be some Landsat data available on the LPDAC um, and to look at these time series of um, specific points that you're interested in um, and looking at both sort of abrupt and gradual changes. So that's it for the first part. Um, of this exercise. The next part that we'll do is show you how to derive environmental descriptors using some polygon data. All right, everyone. Um, next, we're going to do part two of this exercise where we're going to use polygons to create remote sensing derived environmental descriptors. So this portion of the exercise is based on a methodology um, from a paper from Coops et al. 2009 that used remote sensing derived environmental descriptors of topography, land cover, and vegetation productivity to predict species richness of breeding birds in Ontario, Canada. So they used some bird statistics provided by the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas Project. Um, and these data are divided into 10 by 10 kilometer cells. So we don't have the actual bird statistics, but we're going to use those cells to pull out those environmental descriptors from the MODIS data. So, um, and we're going to be looking at MODIS data from 2001 um, to 2000. Five. And at the very first um, page, well, actually, it's page 14 of your exercise, you'll see a description of those environmental um, descriptors that we want to pull out from the MODIS data. To, so to start off, um, we're going to start at the um, Appears homepage again, as you can see here. And then remember to, if you haven't already, remember to sign in um, using your NASA Earth Data login. And then like we did with the point sample, we're going to go to Extract at the top. And we're going to hit Area Sample. So you'll see a very similar um, way to start the request can start a new request, you can copy a previous request, um, or you can upload a request file. So what you'll be doing is starting a new request. So I'll go ahead and do that here. So you'll want to enter a name for your sample at the top, and we can call it OBB1. OBB1 at the top. And in this case, as you can see, to drop, you need to drop a vector polygon file containing the area features to extract. Um, appears requires a shape file, but it'll take a shape file or a JSON file, but your shape file actually needs to be zipped because you know it has all those other associated files with it. So it includes the shape, the DBF, the PRG, and the SHX files. So you need to zip that um, shape file up. But once you do that, you can just drop it like this into the box. So as you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the picture of that polygon. So that's that 10-kilometer um, by 10-kilometer polygon 
and then it's overlaid onto an area in the Ontario um, Canada region. So in this case, we aren't going to want uh, recurring dates because we want to get some information about what is happening during the year um, with the phonology and so forth. So we want our start date to be um, January 1st, 2001. So to get to the um, year, the best thing to do is to click on where it says March 2019 at the top and then use these arrows to get down to the date that you want. So as you see, if I click the left arrow, the dates go down, so we want 2001. And then we want January 1, so click on January, and then you can click on 1, and then the start date, 1-1-2001 shows up in the start date. And then the end date, we want 12-31-2005, so you do the same thing here, click on the date, go down until you see 2005, and then we'll want December 31st. So December 31st, and you can see the start and end date there. So the next thing we'll want to do is select the data layers to be included in the sample. In this case, we have quite a few data layers and they're listed on page 15 of your exercise. There's four of them. Um, there's vegetation and disease, there's net primary production, land cover type, and digital elevation model. We'll put all four of those um, into this request. So the first thing, um, we've also listed the actual names of the data products, so you can start typing in those names and you'll see them popping up in that box. So the first thing we'll look at is the vegetation indices. So it's mod 13A3, so I'm gonna just type that here, mod 13. So you see there's a bunch of products that end up here. So we want the mod, a3 version 6, which is the one kilometer um, monthly data set. And again, we'll click on that and you'll see some other data sets show up there that are all within um, that data. And we want the one kilometer monthly NDVI. So just click on the plus and you'll see it appear on the selected layers on the right hand side. Next, we're going to want the net primary production. So we'll close this one. And we'll, you can either write net primary production or you can put in MOD17A3 and you can see it show up here. So that's the one kilometer yearly NPP product. So we want NPP, one kilometer. So we'll add that to the right. Next, we want the land cover type. So that's MCD 12Q1. And you'll see that show up right here. So that's the 500 meter um, yearly. And we want LC type 2. So you'll need to scroll down a little bit to see that one right here. If you want information about each of these products, you can click on the I and it will give you, give you some uh, layer details. So this is the one we want, LC type 2. Click on that, that'll be added to the right. And one more, we want the digital elevation data, the SRTM. So we'll type in SRTM GL1, which is here at the top version three, and band one, which is our only option here. So on the right-hand side, you just wanna make sure all of these layers um, are listed here. If you don't want one of those layers, if you accidentally put something else in there, all you have to do is click this minus on the far right-hand side, um, and it will delete that layer from this list. The last thing we'll wanna do is select the output options. So there's two options. The first is the file format, and in this case, we'll just leave it as a GeoTIFF. And for the projection, we want that to be geographic. 
like that. So then, just like you did with the points, you'll submit it. And again, sometimes that will take some time to get the results from that, depending on uh, what kind of processing is already being done at the LPDAC. If, the, if a lot of people submit something at once, then of course it takes longer um, than if only one person is submitting something or if there's other things going on there. So just um, be aware of that. Sometimes it goes really fast. Um, the one I did yesterday took about two minutes um, to get the results. But in the past, I've also had it take, you know, an hour. So uh, just depending on what's going on. So now we're going to go back to Explore to take a look at our results for the OBB1. So right here. And we'll, we'll take a look at analyzing some of the results in this web-based interface first before we download the data. So if I click on OBB1, what you'll see here is um, just the statistics. It only has one little tab at the top. Um, the layer, we can actually select uh, any of the layers. Remember, we have four layers here. So the first thing we'll look at, well, let me just show you. We have um, the land cover, the NDVI, the NPP, and the SRTM all listed here. So you can get stats for each of these layers. The first one we'll look at is the land cover. So we're going to scroll down to the layer stats. And if you put your cursor in the one of the orange boxes here, you're going to see the categories. So this particular orange box means that um, the land cover type for um, this for 2001, uh, it, it looks at all of the pixels within this 10 by 10 kilometer square. 54% uh, of the pixels in that square for 2001 is deciduous broadleaf forest. So that's what this information is telling you. The percent of land cover for each of the years that you've designated. And then if you, again, go up into the green area, you'll see that 42% um, are mixed forests, and then there's a little tiny bit at the top, the red one, 1.3% um, are woody savannas. So this gives you an idea of what the dominant land cover type is for each year, which is obviously um, mostly deciduous broadleaf forests. So let's take a look at the NDVI now. And we'll go back down to the layer stats. So this shows you, you can see the, the time period across the bottom, but you can see it for every, every month. And this shows you the, the changes in NDVI. So this matches with the, the high NDVI in the summertime and low NDVI um, in the wintertime and the patterns that occur, the annual patterns that occur over the time. So you can zoom in on a particular year if you want. There's a zoom icon in the upper right-hand corner here where it says zoom to year. And we'll just pick on 2001. So you can see the phonology uh, for each year a little bit uh, more clearly. And on the bottom, you can actually change the time period by using this slider. So you can see um, right now we're just looking at 2001. But if you wanted to look at two years, you can move that slider to the beginning of 2003. And then you get, um, and then you get two years. And then, of course, if you want to get the information about the NDVI for each month, you can just put your cursor over these boxes and look at the average NDVI as well as the distribution of the NDVI values for each of those months. And then, if you scroll down a little bit further, you get some information about the quality. Um, of the pixels uh, for each of these 
years and it, and there's a there's a lot of different co co um, colors here as you can see so if you again put your cursor and hover over the box it will give you an idea about uh, what the quality is of um, the number of pixels for each year so in this case the blue color represents if you look at say um, Modland, it says VI produced, but check other QA. And then the VI usefulness, it says decreasing quality. So about 51 of the pixels for that year maybe do not have great quality. If you hover your mouse over the purple box, these are the highest quality pixels. So in this case, for April 2001, 182% um, of the pixels for that particular month um, have good are good quality, highest quality. So some months have much better quality pixels than others. So that may impact um, what data that you want to use in your analysis. And you can actually um, filter out the bad quality data once you get to the Excel spreadsheet, just like we did for the point data. So now we'll go back to the top window and we're going to click Explore. And we're going to download the data. So I'm going to click the download button and show you what it looks like. So there's a lot of data, a lot of files um, associated with this processing. Um, you'll see some CSV files, um, statistics files. You'll see some quality statistics files. Um, you will also, if you actually want the MODIS data associated with this particular polygon, you can download all the data here for, for all the different data types. Um, as well as each of the months. So there's a lot of data available. I'm scrolling down and just showing you all the TIFFs. In this case, we're not going to actually download the data. We're only going to download the statistics files. And then we'll um, do some analysis with the statistics files so you can get at um, environmental descriptors to be used um, with doing some kind of um, habitat index. So uh, these are the files we'll be downloading. Anything that says statistics.csv. So for example, this one right here, MCD 12Q1, it's so for statistics.csv. Um, and then we'll find the same for the mod 13A3, the mod 17A3, and the SRTM. So if I've already done that. So I'm going to go ahead and start working with each of these uh, CSV files and show you what we'll do with them. All right, the first thing that we're going to do is open up the land cover statistics in Excel. So I've done that already. I've opened up, it's the MCD12Q1. And when you do that, you will see some information there about um, there's some the file name um, the date so those are the the years the five years you can see there um, and and so forth so the the first thing that we're going to want to do is calculate what the dominant land cover class is so we'll need to um, insert a new column after column C, which I've done already. And this column right here, column D, we're going to call dominant land cover class. So you'll type that in the top. And to actually determine the, the land cover class, we're going to put a formula in that looks at the number of pixels in each of the classes um, where you see the names of the classes. So we have water bodies, deciduous, broadleaf forest, mixed forest, woody savannas, and so forth. So what this formula will do, we'll look at the number of pixels 
and pick the class that has the most number of pixels in, in each of these years. So the formula, it's written on, on the top of page 21. You can see it here. So this formula will actually pick the line cover class that has the most number of pixels. And in this case, and in every all of the years, it's deciduous broadleaf forest. So we saw that already also in the statistics that we did using appears. So you just type this formula in D2, and then you copy it down through D6. And you'll end up with a column that says deciduous um, broadleaf forest for all five years. And then what we want to do is calculate uh, the percentage of the area covered by that dominant class. So we're going to put in a column after column D, which is this one. I've already put it in, in column E, called dominant class percentage. And what that does is calculate the percentage that deciduous broadleaf forest has out of, out of the whole 10 by 10 kilometer um, square. So this is the formula that you'll put in. Again, we have it listed on page uh, 21 in your exercise, and you can see, see it here at the top. But this allows you um, to calculate what that percentage is for each year. It changes a little bit per year, but not much. It's generally right around 54, uh, 54%. So you can see that here. So you write that formula in E2, and then just copy it down through E6. And then what we want to know is the number of classes um, that are here, um, it's obvious because we don't have a lot of classes, there's only five, but if you had a lot of classes, you could use this formula to calculate that. And that's really looking at the richness um, of what is in this 10 by 10 kilometer um, square. So in order to do that, we'll add yet another column, um, column F here, and we'll call it number of classes. And then to figure out, you know, how many classes there are here to automatically populate um, this first cell, you'll just do a count. So count G2 through K2. And again, we have this formula written down for you on page uh, 22. And then you'll copy that from F2 down through F6. And it's, of course, um, as you can see, the number of classes is five uh, for each year. So then you want to just save this file. Um, you can save it as land cover um, in an Excel format or you know whatever name you want to give it. Because we'll need to get this information um, later if you want to actually um, compare this with uh, bird statistics. So the next thing we're going to do is calculate topographic uh, variability. So that's the SRTM data. So I'm going to bring that up. I'll make it a little bigger so you can see it. We'll zoom in a little bit. OK, so you can see again, um, since the topography doesn't change over time, so we only have one, you know, one set of values uh, for this particular for this particular square. And the one thing we're going to want to the characteristic that we want to get out of this is the variability of the topography within this square. And we do that by calculating the coefficient of variation. And that's calculated, um, that is actually the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. So it measures, it's a good measure of variability um, of data and relation to the mean. So in order to do this, in, in the cell Q2, which I've already done here, 
you'll type coefficient of variation. I did a little bit of a abbreviation of that, C of variation, but it's the coefficient of variation. And then in Q2, you'll want to put the formula, which is the standard devi deviation divided by the mean multiplied by 100. So you can see the formula here, J2 divided by I2 um, times 100. And again, that formula is also written on page 22 of your exercise. And the coefficient of variation for this particular cell, as you can see, is about 8.5. So that's all we need from the SRTM. The next thing we're going to want to look at is the, um, the NPP. So I'm going to bring up the mod 17A3. Data. I'm going to close the SRT or just minimize it and the land cover. So let's bring up. Oh. Hopefully you can see that. OK, so this is the NPP um, for each year. So we only have what, five values for the five years that we're, um, that we're looking at. And the first thing we're, we're going to want to do is in cell um, C7, so right here, just type in the name of the grid cell, and that's the one, the 10 by 10 kilometer grid cell. In this case, it's named 17AK09. And then the date, time period, will be um, 2001, and this is in cell D7, 2001 to 2005. You can see I've already done it here. And then in I7, you'll um, will be putting the the mean, um, and so you want to calculate that mean. So it's kind of the the mean of the mean. Uh, so you have each of these values here represent the mean NPP for each year, and then we're going to want to get the mean NPP for those five years. So for that one, all you do is the average of these four values. And again, the um, you can see the formula written up here, average of I2 to I16. So it's just the average of these values right here. And it's also written um, on page 23 of your exercise. So this is all we need, actually. We just want the average NPP value over the time period. Um, and you can see it's point, about 0 0.55, 0 0.56 um, in there for the average uh, NPP. That's all we need for this one. So next, we're going to look at a few, a few things with NDVI. So that is the mod 13A3. Okay, so there's a lot of different statistics we're going to be calculating with the NDVI. The first thing we're going to want to do is, um, well, let's take a look at this Excel sheet first. I'll scroll way over to the edge because there's a lot of data here. So the most important things are the dates. So you can see for every month and for every year, how many um, pixels um, you can do, it's that you get that minimum and the maximum um, NDVI values, um, the range and the mean, uh, the standard deviation and the variance and so forth. So it gives you a lot of information um, about NDVI uh, for this 10 by 10 kilometer square. 
So the first thing we're going to want to figure out and um, put down is what are the minimum values, because that's an important part in understanding sort of the NVI, NDVI, um, sort of what that what that minimum value is uh, for each year, and then we'll do an average of that. So in cell R2, you'll want to type minimum annual NDVI. And then across the top, I'm going to scroll over a little bit so you can see it. So S1 through W1, you'll want to put the years, 2001, 2002, 2003, et cetera. And then in the values here across, you'll want to put those minimum NDVI values. There's two ways you can do it. You can actually just go um, go back to your where you see NDVI minimum and kind of look through one entire year, the 12 months of one entire year, and then find that minimum value. So for example, for 2001, the minimum value is 0 0.0098 in March. So then you take that value and put it in S2 right here. You can also write a formula to pick out the minimum values for each of these years, which might make it go a little bit faster. And that uh, formula uses the minimum function. Um, and you can find that, again, on page 23 in the exercise. So I've gone ahead and done that already. I have the minimum values for each year typed in to these. And then, then we're going to want to um, calculate the mean of those values. So in X1, type in five-year mean. Um, and then you'll calculate the average of these minimum values across the, the top. And you can see the formula here, and you can also get it in our exercise on page uh, 23. The other thing that we're going to want um, to calculate is the coefficient of variation of the NDVI values for each year. So that is an in, in indicator of um, the degree of vegetation seasonality. So in we're going to type. CV actually in cell Q1 here. So we're going to have to calculate the coefficient of variation um, for, for all the values first. So in Q2, which is here, you'll type in that formula for the coefficient of variation, which you can see here. In this case, it's J2 divided by I2 multiplied by 100. And then you're, you'll copy that down for the entire, um, for all the values. So you can see I've done that all the way down to uh, row 61. And then, we're going to want to calculate the mean, um, the average CV um, coefficient of variation for each year. So in R3, just below the minimum annual NDVI, we'll type mean CV. And then you'll put in the formula that's the average of the CV for each year. So in this case, the values um, for the first year um, are values Q through Q2 through Q13. And you'll get the average of that. And then you'll do that across for the remaining years. And again, the formula, formula for this is all written down on page 24 of your exercise. And then once you do that, you'll again want sort of the overall average of those five years of the coefficient of variation. So in um, X3, you'll do an average of those values that you just calculated through, so S3 through W3.
And at that point, you have all the information you need that gives you um, those environmental descriptors that you can use um, to create a dynamic habitat index. Um, and then you would take this information and combine it with some ground-based information on, say, um, bird species richness. So we just use appears and some quick analysis in Excel to get environmental descriptors for that 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer tile. So our final um, descriptors are the dominant land cover class, which is deciduous broadleaf forest, the land cover dominance, which is 54%, um, give or take, um, the land cover richness, which is the number of land cover classes in the tile, which is five, and then all the other associated information having to do with NPP and NDVI and topography, which then you can use to characterize that tile. And again, if you want more information about um, this particular approach, um, you can take a look at the Coops et al. paper that we've also provided for you to download. So um, in conclusion, you can see how the appears data um, using the appears analysis web-based tool, you can get some really great information um, about, about points or polygons that you might be interested in. Um, and as I also showed you previously, there's other data besides MODIS in appears. So there's a lot of different data that you can use to help characterize what you're doing on the ground. All right, everyone. So at this point, we'll be taking some, um, some questions um, from you. And of course, always remember that you can contact, contact us later in the week um, as you're going through these exercises. I want to remind you um, that you can email me, uh, my email address listed here, or my colleague, Amber McCullum. Um, if you have general RSET inquiries, you can con email Anna Prados, who's the lead for RSET. And again, all of the materials and the recording uh, will, will be available at our website listed here. So I want to thank you all again for joining us today. Um, again, we'll take some questions, but I hope this has been useful for you. Uh, and just a reminder that we will be giving you a survey at the end of our um, session too. So if you have ideas for future trainings that you're interested in, please let us know. We gave you a little overview of appears. Um, uh, one thing I want to remind you <clears throat> when you use appears is that it may take some time for you to get your data once you request it. It just depends on, the, on what's going on um, at the LP DAC at the time. Also, I wanted to remind you that if you happen to do this on Wednesday, today is Monday, but if, if you happen to try to request data on Wednesday, Wednesdays are days that the LP DAC um, takes appears down to do some website upgrades and that kind of thing. So um, Wednesdays will not be a good day for you to do this exercise. So just a reminder of that. I can see the Q&A, Elizabeth, um, but I'm just doing it straight from the Google Docs. Um, so at this point, we're going to do a question and answer. And this is based on the, um, the Google Docs that you're seeing right now. So what we've done is we've uh, copied and pasted the questions that you've put in our question box and put them in this document, um, which we will make available to you later on um, in the week. So hopefully it'll have some resources in there that will be important to you. So I'm gonna start with uh, question one and then just go through the questions. And if you have um, questions, post them in the question box and then we will copy and paste them into this document. So the first question is, in Google Earth Pro, is there a time slider 
Um, there is a time slider, but we can only visualize past images on specific dates. Can't we visualize images according to our requirement? So you can only visualize images that are already in Google, Google Earth. Uh, we, <clears throat> we can't, we uh, who are not part of Google Earth can't upload our own images and to visualize it, visualize it. So it's only what's already in there. And then to add that, if you use Google Earth Engine, um, which hopefully we'll do a webinar um, at some point on Google Earth Engine, you can actually code in JavaScript or Python and display images for very specific dates. Um, so there's a lot of imagery available through Earth Engine that is not available um, in Google Earth Pro. Okay, question two. Does the good quality filter account for cloud coverage? So we have quite a few questions that relate to um, the QA filter um, for MODIS. So the, good, so the good quality filter does account for cloud coverage along with a lot of other things. So sometimes with MODIS, you just get bad pixels. Um, there's no data in them, or you get a lot of um, clouds or lots of other things. Um, so we've given you some references here that you can see the processing that goes into deciding what's uh, good quality and what's not good quality for MODIS data. There's a lot of information out there on that. So hopefully these three websites will help you with that. For, I'm on question three now. For appears, is there a limit of, of the number of polygons and total area used for analysis? So you can use as many polygons as you want, as long as your polygons are in one shapefile. So you can only upload one shapefile to the Appears website. But within that shapefile, you can have a lot of polygons. Question four, what determines a low quality pixel? I'm just going to refer, refer you to the websites listed um, in question two for that one. Question five, is there a more robust way to identify when the change occurred rather than just looking at the chart? So I'm not exactly sure uh, what that question is, is asking, but what I'm guessing is that it may refer to if you want to visualize that change on the imagery. So you can download the actual data, um, the actual imagery, and conduct a change detection to visualize the change. That would be the way to do it. So on Wednesday, we will be demonstrating a web-based tool that will allow you to do that. Um, we've also done some change detection um, webinars, a change detection webinar in the past. Um, and you can take a look at that on different ways to visualize change. Question six, are multiple polygons within a shape file allowed when extracting a sample? And the answer to that is yes. So this is very similar question to question three. So you can just see the answer um, to question three on that one. Question seven, does that falling menu of layers consist only consist of only layers available for the requested coordinates. So I'm not, since I don't have a peers uh, in front of me, there were several falling menus of layers, so I'm not sure exactly specifically what this question is referring to, but usually in a peers, the falling menu of layers is based on the type of data that you've selected to download for your points or polygons. Is there any time series analysis on marine application or shoreline change analysis or habitat mapping? So there is satellite Im imagery available for all those types of areas and applications. So what this webinar is doing is showing you how you can conduct your own time series analysis using those data.
question nine. Is there a resource available that gives an idea of what layers are best for what type of product? Like quick re recommendation document website that includes what products to search for and use depending on your project focus. That's actually a really great question. We don't have anything like that um, because it does really vary by application and by location. However, we have, we, our set, have considered um, doing something very, sort of very general like that um, for our, our set web page. So, um, so, st so stay tuned. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something I think we'll discuss in the future. Question 10, is there a limit to the size of the polygon appears can an analyze? I'm in, interested in analyzing an area with the size of 11,500 kilometers squared. Can this program handle this large size? So there is no limit to the size of the polygon in, in appears. If it's only one polygon, that's that size, that's fine. Um, just remember that when you download data, um, the results from that polygon, you're gonna get, you may get an average of values within that entire polygon. Question 11. What constitutes high quality data in a peer? So that's the same answer as um, as we had for question two. So just to let you know, just to repeat that, low quality usually includes um, high cloud cover, bad pixels, and things like that. But for more specific information on how the QA data is determined, you can go to the websites that we listed um, in question two. So question 12 says, why is there no dominant land cover class in my experiment? Um, it's, it's hard to know how to answer that question without a little more information about what you're uh, looking at. So maybe what you can do, whoever asked that question, is send me an email and give me more details about uh, what you have done and what your results are so we can figure out what the problem might be. Question 13, why do we need to calculate the coefficient of variation for elevation? In this particular experiment, a variability of elevation is a characteristic that's important to bird species. It may not be something that you are interested in. Um, this was just um, based on some work that had been done previously, and they had already determined that that variation in elevation was important for um, for bird behavior. Okay, question 14. How do you interpret reliability and validity when it comes to the quality of the pixels? Again, I'm going to refer you to the websites um, that we listed in question two about um, MODIS QA data. Question 15, um, that's another repeat question. Is there a limit to the number of polygons and total area used for analysis? So we've said this previously that uh, as long as all of the polygons are in one shape file, because you can't upload separate shape files, then you can use um, as many polygons as you want. Can a raster file be used for extracting an area instead of a vector? I don't think so. I think that you you can either upload a shapefile or the points. But we'll check and confirm um, when we when we post this on the website. You know, it could be that the JSON file um, can be a raster file, but we'll check um, and get back to you. Can we have a higher frequency for NPP data as the one that was showed today? Absolutely. Today's exercise was just an example. Um, so there's many different ways you can do the analysis um, and you can have higher frequency NPP data. Um, MODIS has um, different levels of NPP data. Um, sometimes there's um, eight 
eight day composites or 16 day composites or monthly composites. So it just depends on what your study needs. Question 18, are EO and land viewer equivalent? So I'm uh, assuming, um, I'm not sure what EO, what you're referring to there. I think it's Earth data maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, anyway, they are both, I, if, if you're referring to what I think you're referring to, um, they are both ways to visualize and select and download data. And um, Earth data available through the LPDAC um, has access to a lot more types of data. So it has Landsat data, but it also has MODIS and other types of data. LandViewer, I believe, um, only has Landsat data. Do you plan to generate data in appears with Landsat or Sentinel creating plot products with higher spatial? Yes. So Landsat data will be available in appears. Um, I'm not sure when. We'll have to talk with the, we can talk with the LPDAC um, and find out when Landsat will be available. Sentinel, I'm not sure either. So maybe we can find that out and get back to you. How can we analyze statistically significant trends in vegetation indices? <laughs> so that question would probably require a whole nother webinar to answer. So maybe what we can do is get some, find some papers that would be relevant for doing statistical analysis for vegetation indices and refer you to those papers. I think that's the best way to answer this question. Is there any limitation on the amount of points or area size to be requested in appears? So we've answered that um, question previously. I, I think I do need to check if there's a limit on the number of points. Um, that one I don't know. I don't believe there is, but we can ask the LPDAC and get back to you on that. Is there any predefined length of data or can we perform time series series on any number of data? Yes, you can perform time series on any number of data, but of course, only when that data are available. So for example, MODIS data are only available from 2001 to now. So obviously you couldn't do an analysis on MODIS data prior to 2001. Question 23. The exercise which we did for MODIS data, can we do similar stuff with Sentinel-2? Yes, you can do the same type analysis with any raster data. The, the appears tool right now, though, only works for um, MODIS data. It may allow you to do some analysis with Landsat and or Sentinel data in the future, but it doesn't at this moment. Is there a way to automate the data access to appears such that the data can be automatically download when available? I'll have to ask the LP DAC um, that question, but I believe that uh, it will only notify you when the data are available for download and then you have to download it yourself. Question 25, is the extraction of point or polygon data for other archived data sets within, um, conducted in a similar way as demonstrated for the LPDAC? 
So I assume that you're asking if appears includes other data besides modus um, to to download, and and yes, it does. Um, the CDAC doesn't have the same type of tools, but appears actually has the CDAC data in it. So you can use appears to download the CDAC data. Question 26. When we use appears to build time series with Landsat data, does it take into account the differences between sensors and spectral ranges and radiometric resolutions? So Right now, you can't use appears to download Landsat data. Um, that's going to be sometime in the future, and there will probably be a tutorial on that and how to deal with the different spectral ranges, say, between Landsat 8 and Landsat 5. So stay tuned for that. Can we get level two data for MODIS on appears because the spatial resolution is different if we use level three? Yes, if you remember when you choose MODIS data, there are different data types available, um, different spatial resolutions. So sometimes it can be 250 meters sometimes 500 meters, sometimes a kilometer. So all of those types of data are available um, when you are actually choosing what data you want to use for analysis. Can we get level two data? Oh, okay, that's the same question. Can I analyze the multiple, oops, Landsat images to identify and detect shoreline changes in terms of two classes by appears. So just to repeat again that the Landsat imagery is not available in appears yet. So you can't do this kind of detection um, at the moment. However, we will be showing you how to use LandTrender, which is another web-based tool on Wednesday. So you can use um, Landsat to do your, cha your change detection and look at the, both the visual change and the graphs using LandTrender. So make sure you tune in to our webinar on Wednesday. So question 30. Could you briefly summarize the differences between using appears be fast and open data cube for time series analysis? Um, I would recommend that you take a look at all three of them. They're all very different approaches to doing to looking at change and looking at time series. And and uh, there isn't enough time here <laughs> to analyze even briefly the differences between all of those. Question 31, is there any helping tool integrated in appears to fill up the messing values? So I'm going to answer this question a little bit different than I think you're asking. Um, first of all, the appears has a really great um, help tools available for anything that you want. So they've got tutorials available um, if you have specific questions. Um, about specific things in appears, the LPDAC are very good about answering those questions. So I encourage you all to um, ask them questions if I haven't either I haven't answered them or you have additional questions or very specific questions about what they have at the DAC. So to fill in the missing values, I, I think what you're 
asking is how do we fill in the values where there's bad data? And there really isn't um, any good way to do that in, with MODIS data. You just have to make sure to exclude those bad pixels in your analysis. Question 32, can appears handle batch processing? I will have to check into that. Um, it depends on what you want to do with your batch processing because you can handle, it can handle doing one request but for several different data sets. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I guess we'll need more information on what you mean by batch processing. Next question. For comparative analysis for vegetation indices using Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, can I use appears for this? So again, right now, appears does not have Sentinel Landsat included. Question 34, which software would you suggest to integrate MODIS image data with MODIS Aqua or Terra data values of SST or chlorophyll? So you can use appears to combine um, SST and chlorophyll and look at time series. All of those are available in appears. Um, there are some other tools available for looking at um, ocean data. So I will ask my colleague, uh, who is an ocean person, on the best tools for that, and then we can post it on this Q&A once I get that answer. And right now, that looks like the last question. So just to remind you, if you have any questions as you're going through this exercise, you know, in the next day or so or the next week, um, just feel free to e email me um, and we'll be posting my uh, email shortly. And uh, so email me your question, and then also we'll be uh, posting the answers um, to this in this Google Doc in the next probably probably within the next week or so as as soon as we get some of the answers to some of the questions that we couldn't um, answer. And I recommend that you uh, tune in for our webinar on Wednesday that my colleague Amber will be doing on Land Trender. Um, because we, I know we had a lot of questions today on the use of Landsat for looking at time series. So that particular web-based tool will allow you to do time series of analysis of um, Landsat data. So with that, I think we'll end the webinar for today. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to um, talking with you on Wednesday. Thank you.